Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and this is Sally. Shackleton uh, is taking the day off. So, recently we had this massive typhoon, Hagibis, which um, hit Japan. Uh, this was an exceptional storm, and one of the ways in which it was exceptional, apart from being very, very powerful, is that it went from basically tropical storm to category five superstorm in about 18 hours, less than a day anyway. So when this um, typhoon hit Japan, there was, while it was impacting Japan, while it was over, you know, it had huge rainfall and winds over Tokyo, and actually it, um, caused damage and leakage to a number of the um, bundles of nuclear waste, which is stored in these large uh, plastic bags, it almost, it seemed like, um, you know, near the Fukushima site. You know, a lot of these were impacted with uh, stormwater and so on. So apart from those things, there was an earthquake that occurred during that typhoon. So. I want to revisit some stuff that I did almost seven years ago, looking at the relationship between hurricanes and earthquakes, and then some more recent stuff that I did in 2017, and relating it to this incident, you know, and, and revisiting what we know about the connections between the atmosphere and the oceans and the earth. So specifically, large disturbances in the atmosphere, hurricanes, which depend of course on warm water in the oceans, can then move the ocean water in periodic ways over continental shelves, and it can kind of ring them like a bell, and it can hit these resonances and stimulate seismic waves in the earth, which can then travel through the earth and actually stimulate or trigger even larger earthquakes. So I want to try to relate all these things together in this video and probably the next video. Okay, so first of all, I'll look at this article here. So, Typhoon Hagibis in Japan earthquake. Can hurricanes and typhoons trigger earthquakes? Okay, so this is the strongest typhoon that Japan had seen for a while, and an earthquake struck the same region. Are these two disasters connected? So, it happened on a uh, this was uh, Saturday, so it was on Saturday, October 12th. This article was published the, the next day. Um, so the typhoon hit on the Saturday, sent over a million people fleeing their homes. And on Saturday evening, a magnitude 5.7 earthquake hit the Kanto region and rocked Tokyo. So it hit this region here. Okay, so 6.22 p.m. local time. Um, now, the, there was no tsunami warning uh, for this type, for this particular quake, not, not large enough for one thing, but the reports of the tremor felt in Tokyo have, were pouring in, residents taking to Twitter to express their terror at the combination of natural disasters, large typhoon Hagibis, and then a decent size earthquake, okay, uh, 5.7. So, you know, definitely you feel it. So here's a meteorological image of, of the typhoon as it's closing, as it's coming up, closing on Japan. And then the earthquake occurred right about here. So the question is, are these two disasters connected? Okay, so some scientists at the University of Miami that study, you know, they, they study major tropical storms and whether they can cause earthquakes. So based on major earthquakes, which hit Haiti and Taiwan in 2010, previous, these storms can actually be a factor according to this um, work. And basically the connection is that very wet rain events are the trigger. So the heavy rain induces thousands of landslides and severe erosion which removes ground material from the Earth's surface, so that relieves the pressure at the surface, so there can be uplift of the land and movement along faults, okay? That's the idea. 
I mean, think of torrential rains on a volcano causing a landslide, relieving pressure, then triggering the eruption of the volcano. Um, or think of the storm exciting ocean waves, which then cause vibrations at certain frequencies on continental shells. And if those frequencies match a resonance, if you like, then you can get these so-called storm quakes, if you like. Uh, to call them that. So rain-induced landslides and excess rain can erode material, lessening surface load, and the, the reduced load unclamps the faults, which can promote an earthquake. However, the research showed a strong relationship between these two hazards where a large earthquake occurred within four years after a very wet tropical cyclone season, not while the typhoon was occurring. Okay, so according to this article, the chances of the earthquake striking Japan at the same time as a typhoon is just a coincidence or very bad luck. Okay, so that's what they were talking about um, in this particular article. And I'm going to contest that conclusion that they reached there that they're not connected. So again, have a look at my website, paulbeckwith.net. Um, please consider donating to PayPal to support my work and my videos. In this particular video I talked about how nuclear winter would actually halt global plant growth causing crop failure and mass starvation. Not just from a not just from a exchange between Russia and the US but an exchange between Pakistan and India would cause a significant drop in global primary productivity. So that was my previous video. So we had, the, we had the Japanese typhoon and the earthquake, the 5.7. So there was a recent CBC article about scientists discover big storms can create storm quakes. So thousands of storm quakes found off Florida, New England, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and BC. Okay, so there's a storm coming up as it comes over the continental shelf, it can vibrate the earth, like the, the, the water, the frequency of the, of the long wavelength, long period waves can vibrate the continental shelf and earth and send vibrations through all of the earthquake sensors and, and trigger earthquakes. That's the idea. Okay, so this is in 2011. This is Hurricane Irene, Category 2 storm. Um, basically, scientists have discovered a real-life mashup of two feared disasters hurricanes and earthquakes called storm quakes. So this is from 2019, just recently, and I was discussing this back in 2011, 2012, and I'll show you those cases where I was discussing it. So it takes time, scientists away, you know, they, they basically have to catch up. I'm surprised it took so long for, for a paper to come out on, on this. Um, but basically the shaking of the seafloor during hurricanes and nor'easters could rumble like a magnitude 3.5 earthquake and last for days, according to a study in this week's GRL, Geophysical Research Letters. And I'll show you that work. The quakes are fairly common, but they weren't noticed before because they were considered seismic background noise. This isn't correct, of course. I mean, I discussed this back in 2011, 2012. Um, but basically, you know, according to this, you don't need to worry. Well, these are small seismic events that were triggered, but as I'll show you, some larger events were triggered off Haida Gwaii from Hurricane Sandy. So storms can trigger giant waves in the sea, which cause another type of wave. These secondary waves can interact with the seafloor only in certain places, certain bathymetry, and then that can cause the shape shaking. So it happens only in places where there's a large continental shelf and shallow flat land just along the coast. So this, they looked at 14,077 storm quakes between September 2006 and February 2015 in the Gulf of Mexico and off Florida, New England, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Labrador, and British Columbia. And they use very, very sensitive uh, earthquake sensors to look at this. So seismologists aren't normally looking for this. They haven't noticed it until now. Well, if they Obviously, you know, people have been talking about it, including myself, for, for many years, but that doesn't count in this article. See, if you write an article and you don't research properly what was done previously, you have all kinds of errors like that. 
Okay, so, you know, this was CBC, you know, it was also on PBS, um, and so on. Okay, so, and I showed you the article um, about the Japanese typhoon and the earthquake. So if you go into Google and Google Beckwith storms trigger earthquakes, lo and behold, you can find some articles. Uh, this is some 27 videos where I talked about the relationship, but it goes back much further to, um, I, t I start talking about it in 2011, 2012. So let's have a look at what I did here. So Arctic News, November 15, 2012, so almost seven years ago, did Sandy trigger major earthquakes off Vancouver? So here's a NASA image showing Hurricane Sandy. If you'll recall, that's the one that came up and did an amazing left turn, almost unprecedented, because the storms only curved to the right, uh, because it was because of the jet stream configuration and the blocking. Sandy had to come, had no choice but to turn left. Came across and caused all kinds of damage and flooding in New York, in New York City, if you'll recall that earthquake. So this is an image of it approaching the U.S. coast on October 28th, 2012, so almost seven years ago. And then a seismologist created an animation. Now, the animation can't be found anymore. I searched all over for it. It doesn't exist on the web anymore. I'm not sure why. But, but I, there were Im I took images and screenshots from the image just in case it disappeared. And uh, basically... Here's Sandy coming up the coast, and here's the seismic sensors in North America being triggered, going off. As Sandy, so Sandy's vibrating, changing the water, the ocean waves, the storm surge. It's vibrating the continental shelf, which carries over to the whole continent of North America, excites these triggers, and there was a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake off Haida Gwaii, northern Canada. Okay, um, and it was upgraded to 7.8 later. Now, later the same day, so Sandy's moving north, and basically then Sandy started a left turn. So as it moves up further up the coast, there was a, the seismic sensors all went off again in this configuration, and there was a magnitude 6.3 earthquake off Haida Gwaii. Okay, so these are images of the sensors. And then, so this is October 28th. October 28th, the Sandy's moving. And then Sandy did her left turn and came ashore. And just when it reached the coastline, lo and behold, there was a third major earthquake off Haida Gwaii, a 6.2 magnitude, and it coincided with all of these sensors again lighting up over the plate. So my argument at the time was that, uh, you know, this is not a coincidence. I mean, you can correlate, you know, you, you actually, it's too bad that the movie can't be tracked down, the animation, because you can correlate as these sensors light up, then there's an earthquake. As the sensors light up again, there's an earthquake. As the sensors light up again, there's another earthquake. I mean, that's not, that can't be coincidental. Okay, so... Basically, you know, these were the three earthquakes. This was up, the 7.7 .7 was upgraded to 7.8. That was the first one. You know, times are given here. Then the second one occurred 15 hours later as Sandy was continuing to move up the coast. And then Sandy tur did her left turn and hit the coastline, and there was a third earthquake, 6.2. Okay, and there were other small ones. And here's what I talked about at that time. I said Sandy was a massive storm packing an enormous amount of energy. Um, she carried the energy equivalent of five Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs. As she approached the eastern seaboard, she was detected at the seismic stations in the U.S. As she moved, she was a very large storm. Tropical storm winds within a 900-mile diameter, an extremely low-pressure center, 940 millibar, usually indicative of a Category 3 or Category 4. She sucked enormous amounts of water upward. There was a big storm surge pushed by the winds. It deflected the crest and triggered um, the 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Continued north just before her left turn, triggered a 6.3, lighting up the sensors again. And then the sensors lit up again, and there was a 6.2. Coincidence? I think not. Stress on one side of the plate causes it deflects it downward, goes up on the other side 
So I'll continue this in another video. Thanks for listening.